Yep, we're back and appreciating once more here. Um, Rhett, uh, you also may know me as PQ, here again to uh, share some of the things I appreciate. Uh, just, I've been too critical in my podcasting career, my starred pos- podcasting career. Oh, look at that. The air conditioner just went on. I turned mine off to record. And now that I have a screen in my window, I I have to express extreme appreciation. Let's just close that a minute. To uh, the maintenance guy here at the apartments I live at. I mentioned to him at about 10.45 a.m., that uh, it'd be nice if my windows had screens. And by golly, by like 2.30 p.m., I had screens in all my windows. So that is just, I mean, whose landlord or a maintenance guy just comes dashing over and performs such a task? I'm, I'm, this is good. And indeed, I appreciate it. And uh, some adaptations to film that uh, turned out to be super accurate. I got two of those I want to bring up. The first is one I saw recently, the uh, Super Mario Brothers film. Now, uh, I'm old enough to have played the original game when it was in vogue and, you know, ran out and bought the Nintendo NES system just so I could play it. And I was never very good at it. I mean, once I get to those upper worlds, I just fall and die or get hit by one of those giant bullets. But it was endless great fun back in the day. And uh, I'm still a lousy video game player. But I appreciate the genre. And I know very well that in the modern era, I'm far better watching somebody with a modicum of skill playing through a video game than trying to actually perform the stunts or strategies myself. Um, The the last game I really tried to play was No Man's Sky, and I I just can't. It's just too many buttons, and my brain doesn't work like that. It just doesn't. But the Super Mario movie with Chris Pratt as lead voice, is just splendid. It's a no BS, no frills, incredible special effects adaptation of the original first Super Mario Brothers popular video game. And I, I give it a great commendation. Uh, I'm also not in the habit of giving too many spoilers. So, I mean, I'm not... It, I've basically given you the plot and that it's great. And uh, that, that from there, it's up to you. I think it's still in the theaters, but also I'm pretty sure it will be available on whatever streaming service or realm of obtaining you might use to uh, view these things. Um, I also saw just the other night, uh, I believe it was on Netflix, Asterix and Oberix, the Middle Kingdom. Now, some of you aren't familiar with Asterix. I am not that familiar. I Back in the days, probably in the early 80s, I got my hands on a bunch of European graphic novels, Tintins and Asterixes, and I really enjoyed both, although I think since then I may have read the Tintins, Spottily, and I haven't seen the Tin Tin film, by the way, and I have not read the Asterix comics since then. But from my memory, this uh, it's in French with subtitles. So uh, it, it, those of you who uh, abhor the idea of subtitles, I guess it's not for you. But I I don't mind reading a film and. It, this is just wonderful. It's funny. It's clever. It didn't like hit my head uh, with anything extraneous. It was just a fun story with the Empress of China and the Seven Kingdoms mixed in, and uh, just 
great, great fun and, and fun characters. And again, from my memory, the, the adaptation of the characters was either very close or near perfect. Um, I can't exactly remember specifically, but I think so. Um, there's a new Paul McCartney song that's actually uh, pretty good. It's, uh, what what is the name of it? Hang on a second. Aha, uh-huh, that's why I didn't remember the title. It's just called New, and it has some samples from the past of uh, John Lennon, but tastefully done. And uh, it's really a catchy little ditty. And um, McCartney, that, that he keeps going and does credible stuff, even at his age. I mean, he's far more interesting to me than, say, his uh, rival, so to speak, Mick Jagger. I mean, Jagger, I mean, yes, it's amazing that he still goes out and he can dance. I don't know what special vitamins Mick Jagger takes, but if I could be that lithe and limber at, what, 80-something, I, I will be very happy. Uh, I'm just trying to yeah, keep myself going at the uh, ripe young age of 63 at this point. And um, I do appreciate that I can still move around, breathe, and do many things that people younger than me have trouble doing, but I'm not exactly uh, like Mr. Health and Spry. Uh, I got a little scoliosis that I battle. Um, it, but it, it, again, the appreciation for Paul McCartney. Uh, if you listen to the other program that I do on the Overnight Scape Underground, uh, we have been doing uh, on a program called the Overnight Scape Central a really detailed overview of the Beatles. We've gone over just in general and um, album by album. We just finished Abbey Road. Next week it'll be Let It Be. And it, it's hearing other people's thoughts is really interesting because to me, they the Beatles were it. I, I lived through the era where when a Beatle record came out, the world stopped. And I don't think there's been an artist since that quite had that. I mean, Michael Jackson, briefly, to a certain degree, but those Beatles, they were just a remarkable um, phenomenon. And they really did change music. Before them, very few people wrote their own songs, um, actually performed on the instruments, and uh, they, they did it all, and they did it quite well, and they waked real hard. I mean, there were years where they did three or four LPs every year. Um, they, they just concentrated. Uh, back in the day where people felt that if you just didn't keep going, you know, this was your chance. You had two, three years, and then you would be passe, and you'd go back to whatever you were going to do before your band became famous. You know, working in a garage, selling insurance, the old family business, uh, what have you. Uh, but that was a thing back then. Um, and uh, let's see, in other appreciations, oh, I promised that I would talk about Dave Sim, who is somebody I truly respect and appreciate. Firstly, for his comic book series and graphic novel series about Cerebus the Aardvark, which... It's just a remarkable achievement. 300 monthly issues. I mean, at the beginning, it wasn't monthly, and he had no idea he was going to do what he wound up doing. But once he decided fairly early on, like in the 30s or 40s issue-wise, that he was going to come out with a 20-page comic book every month and tell the story of Cerebus in 300 issues, 6,000 pages, and by golly, he did it. And it's a remarkable story, despite that uh, he managed to offend feminists and a lot of religious people with uh, his mode of storytelling. Very personal, and um, if you're very sensitive to that, you might not want to read it. But otherwise, it's a daunting task, but I think rewarding 
funny, touching, and well worth uh, the time. I mean, he just goes through so much, and he incorporates historical figures like Oscar Wilde and F. Scott Fitzgerald and the Three Stooges into this epic tale of this grouchy aardvark who he told you at the very beginning was going to die alone and unloved. And sure enough, Cerebus does. And uh, But after that, he remained rather uh, retired and quiet. He did a small magazine called Glamour Puss, which was originally going to be him drawing pretty girls from uh, ads in women's magazines like Vogue, Cosmo, and he was having a good time doing this. And in that series of magazines, he started telling the story of the cartoonist, Alex Raymond, his rival, Stan Drake, and all of the influences before them that drove realistic art in comic strips and, of course, comics. And he started using a brush and imitating, literally copying, Raymond, Drake, Hal Foster, Milton Kniff, uh, all of these great pioneering artists, and done so beautifully. And then he got to a certain point in the story, which basically circles around the, and the title of the series is The Strange Death of Alex Raymond, who died in a sports car accident that in comic book history was pretty straightforward. And the more Dave Sim looked into it, the more of a great story and inconsistencies and a mystery he built out of it. And uh, in the Glamour Puss, he just stopped before it ended. And now, I bet you it's 15 years later, a couple of years ago, he published a hardcover graphic novel, The Strange Death of Alex Raymond. And instead of just reprinting what he did, he literally redid all of it. And I think, I believe, finished it. Uh, I've been reading it. I am up to, I don't know, perhaps one-fifth of the way through it, and every page. If you have an appreciation for comic book art and, and brush work, it's just gorgeous. And it's not inexpensive, but you can find a used copy online and probably spend no more than 30 odd dollars. And I will tell you, it is, if you love this sort of thing, money well spent. And I don't think there will be a second printing. Uh, so I would uh, recommend if this sounds interesting, you might dig it up and jump on it before it's like several things he's done. Uh, after he finished doing Cerebus, uh, he received all these letters and there were letters from fans that he had held back and he published these big, thick books of just the letters and his replies. And now you can't find a copy. And when you can, it's a couple hundred bucks. Or I would have it and have read it. Um, just a remarkable guy. I got to meet him at a, a couple of comic book conventions back in the 90s. And it was really just a real guy. Very pleasant. Very easy to talk to. And uh, very accommodating. And uh, full of good advice that, uh, you know, when I was self-publishing a little mini comic, uh, he thought it was cute and, uh, gave me a little critique, which was well-deserved because hey, I'm not a disciplined artist. I just kind of goof around. I just appreciate that I can do stuff with my hands that please my eyes. And if anybody else likes it, that's, that's like a bonus, not necessarily, what I was aiming for, although I guess I would have liked it if I became some sort of uh, noted artist, but I, I, I'm not that guy. I just, I do it. And the, the nice thing about my life now is all of my creative pursuits are 
generally not for money, but just because I want to do it and I enjoy doing it and, and for all kinds of things. That's really the way to approach um, creativity because uh, I have found that, you know, like when I was doing music, if people come to like what you're doing today and when you want to do something different tomorrow, they're, well, why don't you do what you used to do? I loved that. And now you're doing, you know, and it happens to artists in almost every field. So long as they stay in that groove, they build their brand, whatever. But, you know, they, they start doing something a little different and uh, it, nobody's interested. Uh, but I guess if you make enough uh, money, 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 then then everything's okay. Um, it, it's a, it's a strange world. I mean, this neither capitalism nor socialism seems to me to be particularly workable for myself. Uh, spending all one's time trying to uh, to squeeze every penny out of everything, or just like sharing, uh, and the, the, the whole problem has always been like what happened in the 60s when the hippies had all the communes is the people who worked wound up doing all the work and there were always these people who well i'll help you tomorrow and you know i guess an impolite way of calling them would be deadbeats but it's it's a system that eats itself eventually because of that because everybody isn't the same and i hold you know, I have nothing against people who don't want to work, who figure out ways of getting around that. Uh, I just happen to kind of thrive on a certain amount of structured time. And uh, right now I have a work play schedule that I really like. I work mornings and I have the rest of the day. I can do these podcasts. I can do art. I can read. I can go for walks. I can do whatever I want the rest of the time. And it sustains. Although uh, there are other considerations now that I am becoming older that uh, I neglected to think about. And maybe I worked this a little too long, but we'll see. I've, I'm, I'm having my eyes far more open to being a little bit more constructive and uh, maybe, you know, I would, I do artwork and I just give it away. Uh, if somebody likes it, I'm happy that they have it. It's going to be better off on somebody's wall or even if they stick it on their refrigerator with a magnet. It, it's, uh, it's better than it being in a stack of other pieces sitting in a corner in my closet and... That's the way I feel about that. And uh, now, uh, th another thing that I've wanted to uh, touch on uh, for my appreciation and uh, a little wariness is this new uh, ability to work with AI, artificial intelligence, in a creative way. Um, I mess on and off with a text to image and text to video uh site and program and that's just kind of a fun toy i don't take it seriously i don't but it's it's fun feeding clever descriptions to the ai and seeing what comes out and there are different variations and logger the, the coding and all that i have just, i don't get it I don't understand it, and I'm glad there's an interface where I can mess around and I don't need to. It's it's like candy, it, it, and you shouldn't have too much of it. Uh, in fact, it's been a few weeks now since I even touched it, but uh, I do have great fun with the AI um, text-to-image. Uh, some people I know have been messing with the story writing in the chat, the chat GPI, I think it's called. And because of my nature, I'm avoiding it because I could see getting caught up 
in having the AI tell me stories or giving it, you know, concepts and seeing what comes out. I mean, it's bad enough with the visual. Um, when it starts being words, uh, I I just feel I could fall into it too much. But uh, a, a few people I know have at least messed with it. And um, one writer that I know is actually using it to do the parts that he doesn't feel he needs to key in certain plot points and write certain sections, but the descriptions and some of the just overall filler, he manages to squeeze it out of uh, AI, and good on him, I guess, that this is just... I am quickly seeing a future where... A lot of uh, art and graphics and music and books are going to be generated by a machine. And I don't know, I have mixed feelings about it, but the technology itself and how far we've come, I, I am just awed and amazed. And indeed, uh, I have an appreciation for it to continue to tie in the theme of uh, this still very new series of shows that uh, I am doing. Uh, I was uh, trying to post, uh, right now, uh, you're probably either listening to this on YouTube or the uh, network that I totally support, promote, and appreciate the Overnight Scape Underground, which is found at onsug.com, where a myriad of hosts do talk-related programs on pop culture, esoterica, absurdity, and it's just very light, non-commercial. That's another thing. I mean, uh, if there's a product that I can get behind, I'm more than happy to mention it and praise it. Um, I don't know. It would be difficult for me to turn down money to if it's like not something that I don't think people should buy or use. But if it's something acceptable to my sensibilities and some entity cares to uh, pay me to mention them, uh, read their copy if I like it, uh, hey, uh, I used to be say no, I wouldn't ever, but I. It's not a bad gig, and as I get older, uh, I may need to support myself as my uh, muscles and back slow down. Uh, perhaps my mouth will keep going long enough to make that a useful uh, thing for me to be pursuing. Uh, I also am considering doing voiceover work on like Fiverr or something at least to start. And I suppose once you get a few clients who like whatever it is you do, that you can, I mean, I don't want to be rich, but if I could pay my bills and do that, that, that would be awesome. I'd have a deep appreciation of a life like that. And I must express appreciation and they didn't do it intentionally to my parents all of them uh, my mom my father and my stepdad uh, and my stepmother because growing up and my cousins and my aunts and uncles for that matter growing up I was literally surrounded constantly by music um, just from a little, little kid, I remember the Beatles, and I was only, what, three years old when they came up. And, I mean, I had children's records, but my favorite records were things like West Side Story, uh, Harry Belafonte albums. Uh, as a little, little kid, like uh, Belafonte, the, the live at Carnegie Hall records, uh, his folk song records. Uh, and a lot of that stuff is kind of passe. And amazingly, just very recently, Mr. Belafonte passed on. 
And he'd retired from music. I don't think he made musical records since the 1970s. Uh, but uh, I still remember, and from time to time, thanks to all the realms of obtaining, and now YouTube and Spotify, all this old music that was hard to find, you couldn't hear it, it's all right there, and I, I just love that. And uh, my dad and my stepfather were kind of folky, stepfather more leaning towards bluegrass and string band, but there was like Ian and Sylvia and Joan Baez records playing and Judy Collins, all of these like amazing artists and, and all the bluegrass guys from way back, Flatten Scruggs, Jim and Jesse, um, Reno and Smiley. I mean, to this day, a really fine five string banjo picker playing strict bluegrass. Now, there's a lot of stuff today that they will call bluegrass because it uses the traditional albums. But bluegrass, as created by the great Bill Monroe and his bluegrass boys, has very specific definitions that, um, yeah, it, 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 I'm, I and uh, my stepfather who introduced me as a child to bluegrass, it, it could be very pedantic. I remember being so confused as a kid because I was listening to the Beatles and he was listening to bluegrass. And I was wondering, you know, we like the same bluegrass. Why wouldn't he listen to the Beatles? And to him, having to use a drummer was just a sign of some sort of weakness in your musicianship and your creativity. And I didn't see it at all then. But now as I get older, I mean, I had a band for years, Fido 3, which was guitar, bass, and bass clarinet. And yes, we played with some drummers and percussionists here and there, but the sound was just so much purer when we were able to maintain a rhythm without a drummer pointing it out, so to speak. And yeah, to this day, uh, I don't, I certainly can't play drums, nor do I 100% understand the principles of drumming as well as I probably ought to. And possibly because of my stepfather somehow leaving that seed in my head that using a drummer was sort of a cheat on just feeling the rhythm as opposed to having it it just pointed out one, two, three, four. And it, it is kind of banging when it's, you know, just, you know, a rock and roll band with a drummer. I mean, there are fine drummers, don't get me wrong. I mean, the fills and cadences of Ringo Starr, just the solid backbeat of uh, Charlie Watts. But for every one of those... There's half a dozen, to, they could be anybody banging on a drum and keeping vaguely the rhythm they need to, drummers, in popular music. And, uh, yep, yeah. uh, so uh, growing up, having music around all the time, wherever I went, there were people interested and they knew the little kid loved music, so they would play me what they liked, and I heard everything. I was turned on to doo-wop and oldies. I was keeping up with the contemporary stuff, listening to, I think it was WABC in New York, 77 AM, which you know, was the top 40 big station where I grew up. Uh, a lot of the other New York City stations did not have that strong signal, but WABC would just come blasting in in most places. Uh, so that was until my, I was 11 or 12 from very young. That was my go-to radio station. I knew all the DJs, Dan Ingram, Cousin Brucey, Ron Lundy, Harry Harrison. And it, these guys were just my heroes. And yeah, that's what started me on wanting to be a disc jockey. Because uh, I 
thought that these guys were picking the records they played and presenting them. And of course, once I got older and started working in radio, I learned it's quite the opposite. There's a guy called a program director, and uh, you just present the stuff. You don't choose it, and it doesn't matter whether you like it or not. It's your job to sound like you like it. And hence, as you can hear, I never quite made it in radio. But Thank goodness podcasting came along. And while uh, due to copyright laws, for the most part, I can't play you all the bands I like and the music I like, but I can talk about them and talk about other stuff and, uh, like I do here, express my appreciation. And um, uh, we'll do some more of this. This is fun, and uh, we will keep going. This is the fourth a, a, a session of the appreciator and believe me there are many more to come because because i've spent a lifetime appreciating and uh as gene shepherd uh one of my favorite talk radio people he wasn't a politician he was a storyteller and uh, you should check him out uh you might be familiar with him from the movie a Christmas Story, which was his stories put together. He appears in it, and uh, he always wanted to make films. And uh, once he got into that, um, well, his radio career, I think he just got tired of do the unappreciation and the ephemeralness. Uh, this was before all his stuff, thank goodness, so much of his stuff is preserved and online. You did a show, and it, you told these great stories into the ether, and that was the end of them. And you had to do it all over the next night. And that very, you know, the, you couldn't play reruns to any great degree. And now that's it's a different world, and it's a shame Shepard didn't live long enough. I, I think as many people appreciate and listen to him now, maybe more than when he was doing it on WOR radio from like the late 50s into, uh, what, 1977 is when he finally walked away from radio and went on to a retirement. He lived another, what, 22 years. He went out and performed on stage, did his monologues and storytelling, and uh, basically hung around on Sanibel Island down in Florida and uh, hopefully enjoyed his life because he he worked hard and he deserved such a thing. And uh, with that, I'm going to uh, leave you to it. If you have any comments, ideas, topics you'd like to hear me uh, appreciate, the email address is kpqr.torc at gmail.com. And uh, as always, before we part company, I ask you to join me as we Set the controls to the heart of the fun.